know, there's a rule, I learned it as a child, but it's being re been reinforced as an adult, that silence is golden. Anybody ever hear that? Well, it, it, it's a legitimate question. So is, is silent really golden? Jesus is standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. He's before a political authority. It's a very political scene. And Pilate says to him, you're a king. Now, the only, th the thing above all others that would cause you to be condemned to crucifixion is if you expressed yourself as a king in companion, in, against Caesar. No question. Caesar is the supreme authority. If you assert that kind of authority, you're finished. And Pilate looks at Jesus. He knows he's innocent. He knows he's not guilty of what he's been charged with. But he's heard this. He's, he's desperately looking for an off-ramp. He says, so you're a king. And Jesus answered, you are right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Are you really going to look at me with a straight face and say Jesus wasn't political? And one of the most courageous statements he could make as a human being. He just signed his death warrant. He knows how to be quiet. He was silent before Herod. He was silent before the high priest. Isaiah prophesied it about him. Peter picks it up and repeats it about him in his epistle. On most of the occasions where he was questioned, he was silent. He's handing Pilate what he needs to orchestrate the execution. I'm a king. A different realm, different authority. He's already talked to Peter about this. He said, listen, if I needed troops, we could call some troops. It'd be fun to watch. He's coming back with his troops. Amen. You want to be on his side when he gets here. So I want to come back to that question. Is silence golden? I would submit to you, if you'll allow me, that sometimes we're silent because we don't want to forfeit the gold. It's easier for us to be quiet. We don't want to be excluded. We don't want to forfeit something. We don't want the consequence. So we just shut down. In fact, I would submit to you that if we participate professionally in organizations that are ungodly and we don't use our voice, we fail as watchmen and we're guilty. I'm weary of hearing leaders of organizations represent hundreds of thousands of people in ungodliness and immorality and wickedness. And those of us that benefit from the organizations don't raise our voices to say anything. Now, I'm not throwing stones at you. I'm pretty much out front in the midst of God's people saying we're the problem, not the politicians. That we have to yield in obedience. But don't you be silent. At least talk to your friends. Use your voice at your kitchen table, at your holiday table, in your friends group. The, the scripture is not really unclear on this. We are watchmen on the walls. And if we see evil and we don't use our voice, it says it's on us. We may not have the power. We may not have the numbers. We may, but our voice matters. Our silence has not been God-honoring. It's been self-serving. We've got to consider the role we've been taking. We're watching a precipitous decline in the influence of our faith and millions of people will suffer under demonism and paganism if the church is not the light. I wanna to submit to you that we have to continue to grow in our faith. That rather than hear this as an indictment of who we've been, understand it as an open door to serve the Lord in a new way. Peter and James and John had not stood before civil authorities prior to Acts 4 and 5 and said, we're going to continue to talk about Jesus. They'd hidden behind locked doors. They had run in the face of arresting mobs. They were often confused. They would take Jesus aside and say, oh, no, 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 you don't need to go to the cross. So there's very clearly a, a story of growth in what it meant for them to serve the Lord until we find John in the book of Revelation and he's shown the end of the age and he gives it to us. So I want to submit to you that you and I have to continue to grow in our faith. Stop pointing at your birth certificate. You need to be born again. If you've never been born again, don't leave the building today. Don't turn off the broadcast until you make that peace with God. And baptism is important. Get in the pool. 
But having done those things, we have to continue to grow in the Lord. And we really have not had big ears for this. We'd rather argue about eternal security and what we can't lose. And why would you suggest that? And it's not important. We believe in grace and mercy. And I don't want to open that discussion today. I want to submit to you that we have to keep growing. Now, I bring that topic up with a little bit of trepidation, at least a little bit. Because there are many voices in the contemporary church in our nation that are suggesting that we have to update the gospel. That it has to be presented to keep pace with our evolving culture. And I would submit to you that's a false gospel. (laughs) Acts chapter 11. This is Peter. He's back in Jerusalem. In the previous chapter... Through a series of supernatural events, angels that visited Roman centurions, visions from heaven that Peter had, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that imitates Acts chapter 2, except in Acts chapter 10, it's in Caesarea, which is a very pagan city, and it happens to a group of non-Jews, which is outside the imagination of the Jewish community. Up until Acts chapter 10, the Jesus story is a Jewish initiative. The leadership is Jewish, the Messiah is Jewish, the apostles are Jewish, the message is understood in the context of the law of Moses, the message is most frequently preached on the Temple Mount or in the homes of Jewish people. There's just no space in it. It's just very marginal space for anybody that's not Jewish until Acts chapter 10. And then the offenders, the Roman occupiers, are invited into the game. And Cornelius and his household experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues. They accept Jesus, they're baptized, and in Acts 11, Peter's back in Jerusalem. Now, Peter is the most forceful personality in the emerging church. Most scholars, even secular scholars, will argue that it was the force of Peter's character that brought stability to the church in those early months and years while it's trying to figure out what this means. So Peter has been the one that Jesus sent to Cornelius' home, and now he's back in Jerusalem Acts 11, verse 1, the apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. That's kind of fancy language for the Jewish believers. And they said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and you ate with them. And we turned the page. And Peter responds, and I'm giving you the, the, just a portion of it. You can read the whole thing. He said, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us. And I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and they praised God saying, so then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. There's a couple of things that I think are noteworthy. One, they're growing. They have no imagination that the non-Jews are going to get to participate. They have no intention of letting them into the story. Their entire experience, their, their, their entire expression of faith is that they are unique. That's very difficult to understand if you haven't lived amongst the Jewish people. They have paid a tremendous price for being the covenant people of God. Beyond, far beyond most of our understanding. But they have that awareness that there's been something unique in their story. So this makes perfect sense to me, the, the, the angst that the believers in Jerusalem have. What have you done? What have you done? This isn't right. And Peter gives them all the supernatural things. But the line that I think turns the debate is the last sentence. God granted even the Gentiles, what? Three words repentance unto life. They had a change of thought and a change of heart. We didn't embrace their paganism. We didn't cheer for their ungodliness. We didn't affirm their immorality. But God sent me there. There were all of these supernatural components to it. But when I got there, they chose repentance. They brought conformity to the truth that we believe. 
See, a part of the perversion we're struggling against is that we have to embrace ungodliness and immorality. It's an expression of godliness or love or mercy. And in the most stark example that I know of in Scripture, when the church in Jerusalem meets and says, Peter, we're not cooperating with you. He relates the narrative to them. And then he happened to have witnesses with him and they say they embraced repentance. We have to keep growing in our courage, in our presentation, in our boldness, in our obedience, in our imagination of what our faith means in the world in which we live. I had a professor at Hebrew University. I know how deep seated this is. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. And from my estimation, perhaps the most brilliant I ever had the privilege of studying with. We were allowed to turn papers in in eight distinct languages. I chose English. <laughs> Actually, I chose Southern. <laughs> but I remember him. He did a lecture on Jesus. He had the sharpest wit of any professor I ever studied with. You didn't make a casual comment in that class unless you wanted into the arena. Uh, but I remember the lecture he gave on Jesus and he quoted the place where Jesus said, you'll be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that brilliant biblical scholar looked at us and he said, I promise you that both Jesus and his audience understood that to mean the boundaries of Israel. And I smiled. I didn't say anything, but I smiled. And I remember thinking, 2,000 years later, it's almost still beyond imagination that the non-Jewish people are going to be welcomed into the story. So what's described in Acts chapter 10 and 11 becomes the greatest challenge for the church in the remainder of the New Testament. It's not a small thing. They're growing. They haven't changed the boundaries of godliness and holiness and purity and obedience. They just didn't understand what God was asking them to do. Is it possible that God would ask us for a response beyond the one that we have been so fully engaged in up until this point? Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel. You know the drill. Hit the bell for notifications. If you want to, leave a comment.